Previously, on Night of the Serpent. It takes two days for the heroes of Red Bazaar to reach the goblin camp. Along the way, they find a dead dinosaur left conspicuously outside their camp with a blue-fletched arrow in its neck. Along the way, they also see many, many ants carpeting the trees and the branches and the leaves all around them, which creeps the party out some. Along the way, they also circumnavigate a great number of somewhat improbable wooden traps, which the goblins guide them through. Outside the encampment, Wug and Jab are questioned by sentries, and the party gets their first glimpse at a Batiri battle stack, five goblins standing one atop each other, wielding a host of spears. There's a tense moment when the characters aren't sure whether the goblins will accept them or reject them, but it's Ghoulvive, surprisingly, who makes a persuasion check and convinces the goblins to let them inside. Escorted by battle stacks, the heroes of Red Bazaar are led into the goblin village, all the goblins around them chanting, Yar Yak! Yar Yak! Yar Yak! The goblin village of Yar Yak is a shallow bowl ringed around by gigantic ant mounds. The village consists of several dozen scattered huts, but what the characters notice when they descend into the village is that the ground is strange, almost like a spongy netting under their feet. Successful perception checks notice a number of guy ropes that reach up from the corners of the village and connect to an old tree that leans over the declivity, bent like a slingshot. They aren't immediately sure of the contraption's purpose, some sort of trap or defense mechanism, but it's Heck who spots, smuggled amongst the ant mounds, a number of torch-ever-burning prisoners, held prisoner in a very frightening way. They are entombed in the ant mounds, completely frozen as ants crawl all over their body. As they enter the village, the characters are met by Queen Yaryak, a figure they are alarmed to discover is no goblin, but instead a middle-aged male human, attired completely in goblin chieftain regalia, and wearing around his neck a familiar necklace, the Golden V of Vorn. Queen Yaryak peels off his mask, reveals his human identity and his delight at seeing the characters, and leads them into his tent to explain. There, surrounded by his six half-naked goblin wives, Queen Yaryak explains that he is in fact Anwell Creston, a very lost, very confused linguistics professor who somehow has discovered the power to speak goblish. You see, he came here to study the goblins, and while he was observing them, he was struck on the head with a stone in a very particular place. When he came to, he discovered that he could speak the goblins' language, though he has no idea how this came to happen, apart from the head injury. An academic before anything else, he has made thousands of notes about the goblin language and culture, and wants nothing more than to return those notes back to civilization, but cannot exactly extricate himself from his new role as the goblin's chieftain. So what is Creston looking for? He's looking for someone to deliver these notes back to Port Nyanzaru, and what do you know, he has something that the party wants, the Amulet of Vorn, though he doesn't know its true value. When questioned about the amulet and where it came from, he admits that the goblins captured a party of torch-ever-burning soldiers who were snooping around the edges of the camp. Several of them were sacrificed to Vorn, several of them were eaten, and the remaining three are still imprisoned, among them Alessandra Otamu. The party then makes a deal. If they will agree to return the notes to Port Nyanzaru, then he will release the remaining Torch Everburning prisoners. Thirteen also manages to persuade the Queen to release the amulet, convincing him it has sentimental value to Alessandra. Not entirely untrue. During a brief conversation with the imprisoned Alessandra, during which Thirteen can't help but gloat a little bit, they learn how she came to be captured. Searching for Vorn, her party bumbled into the goblin traps and have been eaten one by one, night by night, by the tribe. She considers Creston a traitor, a murderer, and a cannibal, but nonetheless, she agrees to their terms. That night, a great feast is thrown, the goblins reluctantly agreeing to eat a dinosaur the party catches, rather than another prisoner. During the feast, Eku, a vegetarian, won't let Thirteen eat any meat. Gulvife plays with most of the goblin children, and Heck visits the three prisoners, ensuring they each have something to eat, and even shares the moment with Alessandra, a character with which he'd previously butted heads. During the feast, a small skit is performed, detailing how the three heroes rescued the three original goblins when they were held captive by Nanny Poo Poo. During the ceremony, each of the heroes is inducted into the Yaryak tribe, and is thus given a goblin name, and a beautiful, exquisitely crafted Batiri mask that corresponds to their identities. So Gulvife is named Dab, and given a fearsome Triceratops mask. Thirteen is named Jig and given a snarling jaguar mask. And Heck is named Puss and given a screaming harpy eagle mask. 
That night, during the festivities, both Gulvife and Thirteen attempt to get high on centipedes. The problem is, Gulvife is a dwarf and so resistant to poisons, and Thirteen does manage to get high for the briefest second before a frightened Eku uses greater restoration to remove the poisoned effect. Heck, meanwhile, is searching for a place to perch and rest, and discovers the true nature of the goblin mechanism that looms over the camp. It's a catapult that, when activated, would scoop the entire village out of the bowl's floor and fling it across the jungle, essentially to avoid predators or dangers. A lot of the goblins, however, seem to realize that if they're inside the village when this happens, they will all be crushed and killed. Goblin trapsmithing at its finest. The next morning, a very strange party departs. It consists of the heroes of Red Bazaar, the three remaining torch ever burning prisoners, and a small company of goblins. For guides, they choose Wug and Jab, being familiar with them already, but the somewhat suspicious Queen Yariak sends them with a stack of five goblin warriors to ensure that his very specific instructions are followed. Those instructions are to see that his notes are delivered upriver. This will become important later. Upon realizing this, the party elects to send 13 to escort the prisoners, while Gulvife, Heck, and the goblins stay behind. As they approach the fort, 13 and their prisoners are approached by a small platoon of torch ever burning soldiers, mounted on axe beaks, who gladly accept Alessandra and the other prisoners into their custody. Just before she leaves, 13 and Alessandra have a short moment. And during that moment, 13 flubs their deception check, Alessandra now realizing that the party possesses Vorn's amulet. But naked and tired and defeated, she simply wishes the party well. 13, however, is resolved that someday Alessandra will get Vorn back. In exchange for the prisoners, the Torch Ever Burning agrees to furnish the party with a boat. Two soldiers row the boat further up the bank to rendezvous with the rest of the party and the five hidden goblins. It's at that moment, however, that 13 decides to trust Alessandra and delivers the notes to one of the Torch Ever Burning goons, with instructions to give them to her for her to bring them to Port Nianzaru. The guard takes the packet of notes and then <laughs> is struck by a goblin arrow fired from the brush. And that's where we stopped. How did the session go? Uh, I think it was kind of a mixed bag. Some good, some bad. Let's start with the good. I think the ants were weirdly a good detail that really creeped the party out. It wasn't something I intended. I kind of thought that when they met Alessandra, they might just leave her to her own devices because they had been pretty adversarial the last time they'd seen each other. But I think like the horror of how she was imprisoned, her like face partially covered by the mound and just ants crawling all over her naked body was such that they just absolutely could not leave her in those conditions and had to rescue her. So the party was sort of at turns charmed and or horrified by Creston. Uh, this is an original character. He's not in Tomb of Annihilation. Um, um, but I was just, I really got into the idea of a non-goblin, like an academic, who would sort of do these unspeakable things in the name of learning more about this like weird culture and this particularly thorny language. I played him as this, uh, uh, this sort of stumbling uh, 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 British academic character. And it was just a lot of fun. The party he couldn't really decide how they felt about him, if he was good or bad. Sympathetic, but also kind of unsympathetic in a lot of creepy ways. On the bad side, the party still doesn't really know what to do about Vorn, and we're going to kind of come to a head about it. It seems like they're headed towards taking Vorn with them, but for some reason, 13 really isn't into that. I can kind of sympathize from, as a DM, because I don't really want to run this shield guardian, but I'm not sure what Kay's beef is beyond just that they, maybe they just sympathize too much with Alessandra. I don't know. So I have this elaborate theory that oftentimes players will actively seek to ruin their own fun. I know that sounds like kind of a weird statement, but the conceit is, is that I think a lot of times players have this sort of winning mentality where they think that when they're presented with a dilemma, usually like a non-combat dilemma, like here in the village, like how do we negotiate these various different factions? They always try to find what's essentially the cleverest and like the least dangerous approach. But what that ends up doing is it ends up creating this kind of like unfun, unadventurous scenario where maybe they've managed to roll right and kind of slink in between all the different consequences. But that's not what makes Dungeons and Dragons fun. Getting away with something can sometimes be fun, but it's a much harder balance to strike. The really good D&D stories, the really good D&D adventures, in my opinion, are about getting into trouble, about specifically jumping into those dangers, maybe unwillingly in character, but everybody kind of gets excited when things like that happen. So I feel like this episode was a big exercise in kind of learning that lesson, that just because you can safely and carefully negotiate all the different political intricacies doesn't mean you're going to have a good time. I think it was at the very end when that last arrow got shot that the party realized that this was actually perhaps a little bit more fun than a lot of the rest of the maneuvering that they'd been doing. 
it's partially my fault because I do like to put players in positions where they kind of have to negotiate between different people's wants, especially if those people aren't always their allies or aren't always their enemies. Both Creston, the goblins, and the Torch Ever Burning are kind of in this weird neutral space with the party, and it's sort of about where do you draw your lines. So it's somewhat my fault for putting them there, but I also think they could have gotten a lot more fun by just picking a side and saying, okay, we're going to free the Torch Ever Burning prisoners, or we're going to let them be eaten, right? It's kind of up to them. But I feel like in attempting to sort of please everybody at all times, they end up with this kind of wishy-washy, they spend a lot of time negotiating and discussing exactly the right lies to tell people to get them to do what they want. And like, I think it really dragged the session down in a certain sense. So why did the goblins shoot the Torch Everburning soldiers at the very end? So my thinking was that the goblins had very specific instructions from Yariak to make sure that that package goes upriver, not downriver. And to the goblins, who don't really have a great understanding, because again, the language barrier, it looks as though 13 is handing the notes away, and that's the thing they're supposed to watch. So we're going to see how this plays out next week, but I was trying to find a good way to have the characters not necessarily be able to cleanly negotiate their way through the situation like I alluded to earlier. Someone somewhere is going to make a mistake or misunderstand something, and that's going to lead to trouble. And so that little spark of trouble at the end there, I felt like was kind of vital to make the rest of the session work. Chaos sort of wants to break through, and so it's my job to kind of find the right place to put a little bit of pressure and pop the balloon. And I felt like it was a good placement and it kind of saved the session by the end. As a side note, the party is also hopelessly lost at this point in terms of at least spatial relations. They know where Camp Vengeance is. They're very close to it. So they could theoretically go back down the river, but in order to get back to where they were by Mumbala and eventually Oralunga, they'd have to go all the way back through the Aldani Basin. If they want to go back through the jungle, they can try, but they don't really have a great sense of how far they came or what direction they came in or how to find their way back. Perhaps the goblins could lead them back to Mumbala, but even that would still be kind of a roundabout way to get to Oralunga. They haven't quite realized this yet, so I'm kind of excited to see that moment when they sort of break out on their own and realize they have no idea where the hell they are, we'll finally get to do some good old-fashioned survival checks and random encounters in a way we haven't because the party has always been guided thus far. So yeah, some good, some bad. I think it was definitely an improvement on the previous episode, so I'm going to chalk it up to being a good session. People had fun, it seemed like. So what do you think? How do you think I ran the game? Do you have any questions about what I'm doing with Tomb of Annihilation or where the game is going? Do you use goblins in your game? If so, do you accept sort of the basic bog standard goblin or have you put your own twist on them? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear about the goblins in your world. As always, tune in next time to find out what happens on Night of the Serpent. And until then, happy adventuring.